from Kansas State University. This is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson here. And ahead today, the newly named state director of the Farm Service Agency, David Shim. will talk about assuming this new post and what he hopes to bring to USDA program administration in the state. And he'll comment on the role he intends to play as an FSA state director in the 2018 Farm Bill process. Then from the Farm Analyst Program out of K-State, Dwayne Hunt talks about the assistance his program offers to family farm operations, which are seeking ways of navigating the current economic challenges in production agriculture. He'll also tell of a special series of Farm Analyst Workshops coming up in early 2018. And in with his weekly commentary on rural Kansas, K-State's Gus Vanderhoven later on, here on Agriculture Today. Agricultural producers, landowners, and creditors, you have a partner in your legal and financial needs. Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services offers reliable, trusted information and guidance. Whether you need advice for ag credit concerns or are transitioning your operation to the next owner, Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services can assist you in making sound decisions for your business. To learn more, call 800-321-3276 or visit us online. Just a few days ago, it became official the Farm Service Agency here in Kansas has a new state director. But his is a familiar name to Kansas agriculture, and that's our pleasure to welcome him to our microphones for the first time in his new capacity, David Shem. David, congratulations, first of all, on this. Thank you, Eric. Really super excited to uh, take on this new role as the uh, state executive director for FSA. We need to, for those who aren't acquainted with you, let folks know a bit of your background. You are very much a farmer from northwest Kansas. Yes, absolutely. Uh, I come from Sharon Springs, Kansas, uh, where I've grown up on my family farm that was originated in 1928 by my granddad. Uh, You know, we don't quite have the legacy that some of the fourth and fifth generation uh, operations around here do, uh, but still have a great, proud family tradition there. Uh, I went to a uh, small four-year private school school uh, down in Texas where I went, met my lovely wife and convinced her to uh, leave her home state of Texas and come back up here to Kansas and uh, for us to start our farming operation. And uh, we did that in the uh, early 90s and uh, had uh, two uh, beautiful boys that joined us on the farm and has become just a family operation. And I got involved in the uh, Kansas Association of Wheat Growers and serving there as a director and eventually being uh, elected onto the officer positions and, and going through those positions there. Then uh, at that time, the uh, national organization uh, elected me on as an officer, where I spent the last three and a half years as officer for the National Association of Wheat Growers, and most recently the last six months as president of it. But you've stepped down from that presidency to take on this new role very, very recently. Beyond your leadership in the wheat industry, in COG, in NOG, you've likely had similar leadership at the uh, county level in the FSA, have you not? Uh, My wife actually uh, served for several years as both an advisor and a county committee member uh, with FSA. And so, and then obviously uh, with the farm, uh, you know, we used to raise actually uh, registered Charlet, and then I had a uh, commercial herd for a few years. And then through the drought years, uh, with the lack of feed, I decided to get rid of the cattle and focus a little bit more just on the uh, crop production side of it and mainly growing uh, the corn and wheat and milo out there in my neck of the woods. So obviously through that, I've had a a lot of interaction with FSA over the years. So what enticed you to take on this new undertaking? Uh, You know, I was was approached to see if I might be interested in the position and um, something that I did not seek out. But I did a lot of discussion with uh, both my wife uh, and my uh, oldest son, Clay, evaluating whether or not, um, you know, I should consider something like this. And, you know, we kind of all came to conclusion should. Uh, I guess what I, I would just simply say, Eric, is that I really have a passion and a love for our farmers and ranchers across the state and, and what we do and, and truly the heritage that we have. And it's just, it's, it's grown to a really deep-rooted love I have of being able to make sure that I can do my part to make sure we protect and and help the industry that we have that's truly so vital to our Kansas economy. Before we go any further, you'd like to 
tip a cap to those who have uh, held the fort for the last several months in the absence of a state director. And uh, before we went on the air, you were mentioning some names of people that have really carried the day for FSA. Absolutely. That's that's one thing I've noticed. You know, I've just uh, this is just my second day here uh, interacting with the state office and truly seeing what's uh, kind of getting down into detail what's going on and seeing absolutely the great quality staff we have here. But uh, through the years, especially uh, with my role uh, in wheat, I've gotten to know uh, the former director, uh, Adrian Polanski, and really have a high level of respect for that man and what he has done. He has truly left a, a legacy there uh, at the FSA level and, and many other levels. But uh, with the smooth operating office that I have seen thus far and the job that the staff is doing, it's really been refreshing. And, you know, he stepped down when the new administration came into place. And at that time, uh, Jack Salva became the uh, interim director. He then retired here uh, just this uh, fall. And in the meantime, we've had uh, uh, Terry Hawk step into that position and fulfilling that role for the last couple of months. And again, like I said, the the way the office has been operating, you know, they have done a great job. Uh, The reception that I have gotten from the office has been just incredibly warm, and they are excited, and I'm definitely excited. And as you say, literally days in the office. So there's a a bit of getting to know what's going on period here. But what's the most immediate thing, David, that you see that uh, needs to be contended with in as far as the state directorship and FSA administration? Well, you know, obviously uh, what FSA's role at the state level entails is that that boots to the ground and and making sure that those policies and and that have been carried out from the farm bill get put into place correctly back at the farm level. And obviously that's what we're focusing on right now is trying to make sure a lot of those programs are getting in place. And a lot of it, uh, again, uh, Jack and Terry have done a phenomenal job, but it's also been a need to have that position filled by an SED. Terry has, uh, in my working with him and, and talking with him here, has been just really very grateful that he now has somebody to, on board here to, that we can start to moving forward. And so we've got a lot of issues out there on, on the state, whether, uh, you know, it's disasters that have uh, occurred earlier this year with wildfires or hailstorms or various things like that. But it's now we're, we're definitely uh, focusing on trying to make sure we're doing our part to get the assistant or help those producers, those ranchers, those farmers out there to truly uh, continue to uh, make their operations viable. And just the routine mechanics of farm programs, it's it's an overwhelming <laughs> level of stuff that has to be done, isn't it? Yes, absolutely. You know, right now it's, uh, uh, I have uh, talked with a lot of people and even my, uh, my staff back there very much said, uh, are you drinking from a fire hose? And absolutely, <laughs> I've been drinking from a fire hose here. But, you know, also I've had a lot of knowledge and, and uh, obviously with my background in farming, being in involved in, in uh, farm bills and, and the industry that I do have a lot of knowledge and I have already found in the just the short amount of time that I've been there that has given me a wonderful foundation that I'm able to start to build on. Definitely have received a lot of compliments and I appreciate it from the staff that they're very positive and how quickly, uh, you know, been able to pick up things and, and move forward here. So obviously I'm getting my legs, my feet underneath me right now, but we are definitely charging running forward fast. And since you mentioned the farm bill, the 2000 2018 version, the deliberations in the preliminary stage and uh, some maneuvers, if you will, and proposals already underway. What can the state FSA director bring to that process? You know, that's something that, uh, as I have been involved in the uh, the ag policy side of things with the wheat growers and that, I guess my eyes uh, have been a lot opened up in that area. Really, a vital role that our uh, SEDs or state executive directors do play, you know, because uh, a lot of times when, when producers, uh, you know, are trying to implement a current program, firsthand knowledge of the challenges or the way things are working good comes back directly to that FSA office. And we know that. We find that out at a state level, and it becomes that responsibility of an SED to basically be reporting and letting USDA know, you know, uh, people back at Washington, D.C. know what is actually working out there. But obviously entailed within that is the whole aspect that we can start to look at forward ways that we can tweak a new farm bill to truly help to accommodate and help these ranchers and farmers out there in in a more efficient and a better fashion. So as that conduit, are you hearing tangible things coming through that are being passed along to you even at this early point? 
You know, I, I have already heard, obviously, it's been a, a very fast pace uh, for the last several days. But yeah, even now, you know, we're, that, that pipeline is there and, and we're going to continue to uh, be reaching out and, and reaching out, you know, not just across the, uh, uh, the state, obviously, but also uh, clear back to the east towards Washington, D.C., making sure, again, the communication level is very, very important uh, between us and between USDA to make sure we're doing the job, but also for them to understand what's going on back here, too. So it, we're, that's in the process, and we're going to continue to be emphasizing that in the future. All right. Well, to close, your aspirations as you are serving as the state director of the Farm Service Agency, anything in particular you hope to bring to the scene as director? You know, obviously just getting into uh, my feet underneath me right now and looking and trying to evaluate and seeing opportunities um, and as we do go forward in the future. I have shared uh, already a, a lot with the staff. One of the, I guess, the two components uh, of, of what I have shared with the staff, one of them is simply, how would I say, a respect for the heritage that has been there. So in other words, you know, understanding what has been working and what's been tried and that helps to establish kind of a second component, and basically that's, you know, moving forward or, or starting to establish a legacy as we go forward. And that the part of that is, you know, trying new things and finding out ways that work. So, you know, we're kind of focusing on a heritage and a legacy as we work forward to there. And uh, just with the phenomenal staff, I'm excited, you know, really uh, I've jumped in there and, and uh, given a lot of time already and, and so, super excited about it, and the staff is excited about it. So I think we're already on the road to doing that. Looking forward to visiting with you in this venue from time to time as we interact with you and your staff and pass along the latest information on USDA programs administered through the FSA. Congratulations once again, David, and we appreciate you sharing this introductory moment with us. Thank you. He's the newly appointed state director of the Farm Service Agency here in Kansas. A few minutes there talking with David Shem here on this part of agriculture today. We'll be back after this break. You're listening to the K-State Radio Network. Agriculture and food systems are the main drivers of the Kansas economy, but must be improved in order to feed the world's growing population. How are we going to do so? Reduce food loss, find ways to preserve grasslands, and help families stretch their dollars. Global Food Systems is one of the five grand challenges K-State Research and Extension is addressing. To learn more, visit www.ksre.ksu.edu. You're listening to Agriculture Today. Well, we talk with great frequency about the economic conditions in production agriculture right now, and there are some definite and clear challenges that you producers are having to encounter. It's an opportunity to remind you once again of a service out of the Agricultural Economics Department at K-State that's very important in times like these. It's called the Farm Analyst Program, and its director, K-State's Dwayne Hund, is Mike's side once again. For Dwayne, you will be heading out on the road, actually have been for some time, but really cranking up the schedule here soon to meet with farm families who are looking to farm analysts for answers to questions about management. And we want to get into all of that, but we always like to ask you about what you're seeing as far as economics for our farmers and ranchers out there right now. Well, without question, there's uh, haves and have-nots this this year. We had some regional droughts in some spots that really devastated some areas of the state. For the most part, I think the state had average crops to even some that were very good. The cow situation is holding its own for a lot of people. I will say if it wasn't for soybeans, we'd probably have a different picture on the cropping side. But the main thing I think we're, we're looking at now more than anything is the projections going forward don't look real rosy. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's tough to uh, figure out if we want to expand an operation and, and go into debt. Is now the right time to do? Is now the right time to bring in that uh, next generation and, and make them part of it? Is now the right time to uh, maybe uh, slow down and uh, try to conserve uh, some resources for a better time in a few years? Uh, a 
lots of questions and, and lots of different answers for those questions. And no simple answers to any of those, Dwayne. Never are. <laughs> We want to, again, remind folks of the Farm Analyst Program and how it uh, can aid in seeking those answers that are well-tailored to each individual operation. It is an opportunity for farm families in a confidential setting to visit with somebody about what's possible in working their way through the economic difficulties, right? It is, and uh, we let the numbers guide our direction. Uh, We sit down with farm families at their kitchen table in a confidential setting and and put together financial statements, put together budgets for their different enterprises, their different crops and their livestock enterprises, and then roll that all together in a projection for a cash flow analysis to say, if you did what you want to do for the the coming year, what's it going to look like at the end of the year? Are we going to be able to service our debts? Uh, Do we have enough money for disposable income for personal living expenses? Uh, Do we have anything left to replace equipment that's aging? All of those things roll together and give us a a clue as to the the ability of the operation to be competitive and in some cases even survive. If the farmers that are on the edge or think they are on the edge would avail themselves of this opportunity to uh, have an analysis like this done, they may find out that they're doing just fine or they may find out that they are being proactive in trying to to stop a, a problem that is occurring before it gets too late where they don't have a choice. The core of farm analyst, in large part, has been over the years the FinPAC analytical tool. That's still being employed here? It is. And FinPAC is an acronym for financial package, and it's a set of software that has been around for 40 years uh, and been continually improved mm-hmm. at the University of Minnesota Extension. We've used it here in Kansas uh, ever since we started back in 1985. It's an excellent tool to uh, do projections with. It's not an accounting program, but what it does is it takes your your records for the last three to five years, and uh, we use those to make projections going forward. And I have a core group of about 50 producers I work with every year that will really tell me what the trends are in many cases for agriculture for the next year because uh, they have done such a good job over the years of putting together accurate data and helping me put together projections for them that I have a pretty good idea what 2018 is going to look like. Mm -hmm. So you combine the FinPAC software with the interactions with your staff as they visit one-on-one with producers and their families, and you get a good dialogue going about what is, in fact, feasible for that operation moving forward. And the important thing here is that, that communication, as you said, the dialogue is critical so many times, especially if we get to be a little bit concerned about a situation, we tend not to want to address it because we fear that uh, maybe things are going to be worse than what they turn out to be. Mm -hmm. So if we can uh, just avail ourselves of the opportunity in a confidential setting to discuss the different avenues and approaches that we might be able to take, if we'll look critically at the different enterprises we have and focus on those that are most profitable, If we just change some of our resource base to fit what our desires are to do that really is in our hearts to be a part of, many times we can find a successful outcome much better than what we currently have. And just to share an example of something that you have been talking up with producers, as a matter of fact, yourself, that gives a notion of what farm analysts can provide. In interacting with crop producers here in recent years, you've been suggesting the idea of the net share leasing agreement, and you can take this story from there, Dwayne. Well, you know, a lot of people had concerns here with the downturn in grain prices since about 2011 and going up till this point uh, about uh, cash rents being too high and not being able to service their expenses and their debts and much less have anything left over for personal living expense. Uh, There's also challenges with more land being owned by out-of-state landlords, and in many cases, uh, those out-of-state landlords don't understand why their cash rents uh, should be uh, changing to fit the the current profit situation. Some of them are on crop share arrangements where the landlords to pay their share of uh, fertilizer and chemicals or maybe some other costs, and it's hard to get uh, some of these landowners to understand uh, why these bills are coming. So I started looking at it about 10 years ago and, and started advocating that Farmers consider what was called a net share, either a 75-25, or today I'm mostly working with farmers uh, advocating an 80-20, where the landlord receives either 20 or 25 percent of the grain production as it goes across the scales, and they pay no expenses uh, towards that crop. The tenant fully funds the the operation and uh, takes either 75 or 80 percent of the production, leaving the landlord with the income from the harvest. 
Now, what that can do for the tenant is uh, help control some of his costs because he knows uh, exactly uh, what he's going to have from the production. But what's good for the landlord in this case is the landlord can uh, count on uh, having some income come in and not have to worry about paying their share of any expenses. And as grain prices go up, which we hope they will here in the next year or two, they'll get more income out of it than they would if it was a flat cash rent. So I really think, Eric, it's a good win-win for everybody. It's good for the tenant, it's good for the landlord, it's fair and it's equitable, and it's just a matter of whether uh, we can make it work on an 80-20 or we can go to a 75-25. But I had one lady tell me that, farm wife tell me that their landlord in Pennsylvania was really enjoying going to the mailbox twice a week because they were getting checks from the elevator as their grain went across the scales and was sold. And uh, it would seem like uh, they were real happy with the arrangement. And we share that because that's one mere example of the kinds of alternatives that can be discussed one-on-one with the farm analyst representatives out there. Exactly. And uh, not everybody uses cash rent. A lot of people uh, uh, have other avenues of renting ground on shares and uh, other cooperative arrangements. But cash rent is very common. And I would say that this is very applicable to dry land. Irrigated land is a little bit different of situation, and uh, that may or may not work on a net share basis, but uh, certainly for the standpoint of a dry land crop acreage, uh, I think it's something that needs, needs to be considered. And every case is unique. You know, some people might have cash rents that are reasonable and not going to be changing, and they can get along. But for those that are having some challenges there to cash flow, this might be something they need to take a look at. How one might explore the opportunity of using farm analyst. There are contact points, obviously. There are. Uh, about 50% of our referrals on an annual basis come from the Kansas Ag Mediation Service. Individuals will uh, uh, contact the Kansas Ag Mediation Service with uh, different issues, and if those issues look like that they could use the, the assistance of a farm analyst, then uh, that program will make referrals to myself or our, our team of other analysts and go out and work with these families and help them develop strategies for uh, mediation in different areas. It could be a debtor-creditor situation. It could be uh, uh, two brothers that need help reconciling their differences. In many cases, it could be a son came home and as part of the operation, and there wasn't uh, a real clear understanding of what was expected and uh, how the economics were going to work with that new family being part of the operation. So a merit of different situations can be involved in the consultations that we have. So just uh, bringing the numbers through brings the dialogue to to light. Mm -hmm. It brings the the communication of four. And I have many people that tell me that just that one day a year, getting to sit down and strategize and look at their operations and talk about what what do we want to be five years from now? What's this operation going to look like 10 years from now? Are we pursuing the right strategy? Are we pulling together? Lots of really great communication occurs to uh, help us forge a path because we all know the future is going to happen whether we make it happen or not. And uh, if we're proactive, uh, we can have some control over how this works. By the way, the Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services number is 800-321-3276 or 321-FARM, if that's easier to remember. There is now also an opportunity to make use of what Farm Analyst has to offer at five central sites around Kansas coming up in January and February as part of a special workshop series. Dwayne, we want to tell folks about that after the break. Please stand by if you would. Dwayne Hund is here, the director of the Farm Analyst program out of K-State. We'll return with Dwayne shortly here on the K-State Radio Network and Agriculture Today. For 25 years, K-State Research and Extension's Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services has been providing a no-cost, confidential place to call in and visit with an agricultural lawyer. Our experts are available to help you producers handle legal and financial issues, Explore your options and generate solutions. Call us at 800-321-3276 or visit us online. Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services.
Welcome back to Agriculture Today here on the K-State Radio Network. Eric Atkinson with you, and we want to round out our conversation with the director of the Farm Analyst Program out of K-State Agricultural Economics, Dwayne Hund. Earlier we went over with Dwayne what that program can offer to farm families and operations in as far as guidance for working through the tighter economic times that we see on farms and ranches at present. And Dwayne, just an added few moments here to let folks know that the wares, if you will, of farm analysts will be on full display at these Farming the Future meetings that Agricultural Economics at K-State will be putting on in the coming weeks. And that'll be a prelude to another series of workshops specifically availing the farm analyst services to producers. You might explain. Well, Farming for the Future is uh, another program that is kind of looking more progressively towards the future. And with that, uh, we're going to give people a little bit of a taste of what the Farm Financial Workshop can do for them, which is a separate program that they can sign up for at the conclusion of the Farming for the Future seminars and be a part of the opportunity to uh, do a FinPAC analysis on their particular operation in a confidential setting. We will have assistance from farm analysts as well as some county agents to put data together and help uh, individuals uh, get a chance at a reduced cost to be part of a financial uh, analysis that uh, will give them some insights if they've never done this before. We're really looking forward to doing this, and we're looking forward to making this available to up to 25 producers per location here this winter. We, we tried to spread these out so that they're convenient for as many producers as we can uh, assist. So we're going to have locations in Salina, Kingman, Colby, Dodge City, and Emporia in the months of January and February to uh, hold these uh, financial workshops and give people a taste of what FinPAC can do for them as far as giving them guidance. And equally important is uh, working with a particular farm analyst to find out what's really uh, necessary for this operation, what are their challenges, what, what can we help them with. And in every case, what we're looking for is to identify the areas that will help them improve and get the right experts in place to give them the advice that they need. You can find all of the information on both of these series of meetings on agmanager.info. So check that out, the Farming the Future workshops, Pratt, Salina, Scott City, Emporia in December and January. Then the following farm financial workshops, which will feature the farm analyst process in Salina, Kingman, Colby, Dodge City, and Emporia, January into February. Check that out at agmanager.info. Just as a parting thought, though, Dwayne, you would encourage families that are wrestling with economic issues or perceive that they may come down the pipe to certainly pursue the farm analyst services as need be. We would really like to have as many families as we can accommodate at each of these locations be a part of this process. Uh, we, we obtained some grant funds to help us put these on at a reduced cost for the normal fee for the analysis. I might also add that you don't have to attend the Farming for the Future conference to sign up for the Farm Financial Workshops. If it doesn't fit your schedule to go to the Farming of the Future conference, you can still be a part of this Farm Financial Workshop uh, opportunity that's going to be available. You can inquire further as well through your local extension office likewise. Dwayne, we appreciate the word on this. Good luck with this series as it comes up here in the not-too-distant future. We appreciate your time as always. Thank you, Eric. He's the director of the Farm Analyst Program out of the Department of Agricultural Economics at K-State. That's Dwayne Hund talking about what the program can provide to families who would need assistance in working their way through the economic issues in production agriculture currently. Have you ever thought about where your food comes from? If you're thinking the grocery store, think again. Facts show that the American farmer feeds more than 129 people. They are continually increasing and improving their operations. A wide variety of crops and livestock are grown in Kansas as well as the United States, providing food to your dinner plate. Next time you see a farmer or rancher, thank them. For more information, contact K-State Research and Extension. This is Agriculture Today. Stop, look, and listen. This is our state, Kansas. Back home, we make coffee. Strong coffee. We need it. That's Gus Vanderhoven, 
of Kansas State University with comment on life in rural Kansas. How do you keep your balance? Oh, I'm not talking about an acrobat on a tightrope who purposefully crosses a deep chasm way below the cable he or she is crossing with or without a balancing pole. No, with all due respect, I'm not talking about that kind of balance. I'm talking about emotional balance. Take Sunday morning, a quiet morning starting off as a beautiful day with overcast and some mist, a fog, but with the promise of sunshine later, a quiet breakfast as usual, and then a few sneezes, morning sneezes. Then, all of a sudden it starts, a nosebleed, which runs and runs and will not stop. It's the warfarin taken after open-heart surgery and the placement of the pacemaker. It's not funny. I decide to call 911. We place the call. They come to help them find the place. I walk to the bottom of the driveway. We need to go to the hospital. They can take us or we drive. I opt for Annika and my daughter to be taken as that means they go straight to a room. With blood running like a fountain, I see no other option. So off they go. It's a short run, but they are in control. I think it was someone at Michigan University who had the smart idea that when carefully monitored, warfarin might be useful for human use. Great idea. I too drive to the hospital and locate the bleeder. It's not like Hansel and Gretel who drop crumbs in hopes to find their way back in going in the woods. That did not work as birds picked the crumbs. By the time I get there, the doctor on call and staff have stopped the bleeding. They know what to do and have the medication adapted for this use. And we wait. Then after a couple of hours they release her, the bleeding starts again. Remember, I asked, how does one keep one's balance? After another half hour, they do let us go. This time with a close pin-like structure pressed onto the lower nose. I'm now married to a rhinoceros. Back home, we make coffee. Bloody strong coffee. We need it. And then my daughter says, Pops, if you need a farm walk, you go. I will hold the fort. I know she can and would, but I'm restless. A farm walk won't do it. She understands. While Annika goes and rests, I try to relax. Open heart surgery is not for sissies. And that counts for the patients first. But neither is it for those who attend to the patient. You are on pins and needles all the time, 24 hours a day. And that is where I ask, how do you keep your balance? For some people, it may be music. For others, a stiff drink. For others, meditation or their belief in God. After we came home, I opened my computer and had an email from a friend in the old country. It had photos of the place I love most, beautiful fall photos she had taken and now shared with me of the places in the woods, the old farm, the fields. She walked it to soften the sadness of losing her younger brother recently. The photo showed the path she walked and the path I know. All I wrote back was, Thank you. It was just what I needed to find my balance again after the morning. Then I stepped outside on the hill. The weather now was warm and sunny. It was special with the light fall on the leaves and the haze far away on the hills, outlining the distance. 
I walk the trail slowly, looking and noticing the scent of fallen leaves. I sat down on several of the benches. I looked at the silken threads of trembling spider webs attached to seed pods. I looked at the colored fall leaves and noticed a red oak tall and straight among other trees. Then I looked among the understory shrubs and I saw a small one, the same kind of tree. I went to get a stick and wire netting to protect it, the tiny tree from rabbits. It germinated and stands where I will let it grow. A few years from now, when it will have reached some height, I will have to protect it from a buck needing to scrape the velvet from its antlers. That will be a few years from now. Sitting under the cedar and warming myself in the afternoon sun, I looked at the blue cedar berries covering the ground at my feet and remembered when a friend had said to me after the patch burning on the farm, If only I could cut the female cedars I have on the farm, it would help control those weed trees. But, Drew, in the deep and steep gullies, I like the tree. And birds love the berries. They even get intoxicated on them when eating the fermented fruit. Walking on my hill, I slowly found my balance back which made me think once again that for those of us who need a natural environment to hold their balance, it should be available in parks, large and small, or even our own backyards. Even the very familiar can give us peace of mind if we just take time to look and listen. Gus Vanderhoven of Kansas State University with his weekly commentary on rural Kansas. As we part today to remind you once again, you can subscribe to a podcast of this program. Very handily, simply go to our website, ksre.ksu.edu slash news. Click on the radio network tab and then the Agriculture Today link ksre.ksu.edu slash news. Meantime, thanks for listening in today. Eric Atkinson here for Agriculture Today over the K-State Radio Network. <music>